New Section 250 provides regular U.S. corporations a two-prong deduction. First, 50% of the amount includable under Section 951 Cap A, plus 37.5% of certain foreign profits. This deduction applies only to regular domestic corporations, not to flow-throughs or individuals, just corporations. New Section 250 introduces some jargon unique to Section 250, and I'm not going to use it. New Section 951 Cap A requires U.S. shareholders of controlled foreign corporations, or CFCs, to include in their income their aggregate share of the aggregate return on assets of those CFCs in excess of 10%. This video won't cover how to compute these amounts. In addition, subpart F requires inclusion by U.S. shareholders of their shares of certain income of CFCs, regardless of the return on assets. See my videos on subpart F for details. The new Section 250 deduction allowed to regular corporations is half of the 951 Cap A inclusion. Thus, a corporation is in effect taxed on half of the profits of CFCs in excess of that 10% return on assets. Note that a regular corporation gets a deduction for 100% of dividends it receives from CFCs. Thus, a corporation owning CFCs is taxed currently on part of the earnings of the CFC, but not taxed at all on dividends. U.S. corporations also get a deduction for 37.5% of part of their foreign income. They are fully taxable on the profits up to a 10% return on the assets used to produce such income, but they get to deduct 37.5% of the profits in excess of such 10% return. Foreign income for this purpose includes income from sale of property if the property is sold to a foreign person and is to be used outside the USA. Foreign income also includes income from performing services outside the USA. Note that I haven't said anything about the source of income under the sourcing rules related to foreign tax credit. This Section 250 determination of what is foreign is completely separate. In fact, with the change in the source rule for sale of goods that came into effect in 2018, much of this qualifying foreign income may be U.S. source. There's a further rule for property. If the property is subject to further manufacture or modification in the U.S., then it is not considered used outside the USA. There are two exceptions to this further rule, and I think together they effectively exclude everything from it. First, a sale of an item is considered a separate sale of each component of the item. So unless the component itself is modified, this additional rule should not apply. Regulations hopefully will clarify this. Second, related parties are effectively looked through. These exceptions to the further rule are quite complex. The 37.5% deduction is not limited to tangible property. Any property can qualify. It also doesn't matter who created the property or where it was created. Sale of any property qualifies if it is to a foreign person for use outside the USA. Sale includes leasing and licensing. So sale by a U.S. corporation of software written in Ireland for use in Germany should qualify. The deduction is a percentage of net income of the type that qualifies. Here's how to determine the amount of this qualifying income. Remember, all determinations are made in U.S. dollars using U.S. tax principles. First, identify and separate gross income of the right types. Gross income is sales services and other revenues, less cost of goods sold. However, exclude the following types of income from both foreign and total. 
Subpart F Income, Section 951 Cap A Inclusions, Income of Foreign Branches, Dividends, Financial Services Income, and Domestic Oil and Gas Extraction Income. Rents and royalties are included and could be qualifying for an income. Then, reduce the gross income by deductions including taxes properly allocated and or apportioned to that income. Allocation and apportionment of deductions is done under the complex rules of Regulation Section 1.861-8 through-14. It's not clear why the statute says deductions including taxes rather than just saying deductions. By the way, branch means a qualified business unit which is defined pretty much the same for accounting and tax purposes. Once you've determined qualifying taxable income and total non-excluded taxable income, it's time to calculate the deduction using the formulas, simplified versions of which are shown here. I've intentionally eliminated the one-use jargon that's in the code. I'm using A to denote the total qualified income as just computed. I'm using ROA percent to be the percentage of return on assets. B is just an intermediate calculation for ease of reading. B is A times excess return on assets percentage divided by the total return on assets percentage. So the deduction then has two pieces. The first is 37.5% times B times the ratio of foreign qualified income to total qualified income. The second piece is 50% of the Section 951 Cap A inclusion. See, it's pretty simple in concept. The hard details are in allocating and apportioning expenses and tracking asset basis to compute the return on assets percent. The return on assets percentage is computed using only qualifying income and assets used to produce such income. Asset amounts are the average of quarter-end adjusted tax basis of tangible depreciable property that is used in producing qualifying income. Thus, such items as inventory, accounts receivable, and intangibles are excluded from the computation. Where an asset produces more than one type of income, the basis is apportioned using the ratio of types of gross income produced by the asset. The relevant assets include not only those owned by the corporation or consolidated return group directly, but also the corporation's share of assets owned by or through partnerships. In computing adjusted basis, Depreciation is recomputed using the alternative depreciation system of Section 168G. Under that system, the class life must be used for most types of property, but there are special rules for some types. Depreciation is determined under the straight line method. Thus, there is a potentially big difference in depreciation deductions that reduce qualifying income and the amounts that affect adjusted basis for computing return on assets. This will require dual sets of depreciation and historical basis calculations for nearly every corporation. Here's a fairly simple example. C, a regular U.S. corporation, has 10 million of taxable income. All of its income is qualifying income. 40% of its sales and gross income are from selling goods to foreign persons for use outside the USA. C has $30 million in adjusted tax basis in tangible depreciable property, determined using the alternative depreciation system. So the calculation goes like this. Return on assets is $10 million divided by $30 million, or 33 and a third percent. The excess return on assets is 23 and a third percent. The deduction is 37 and a half percent times this excess times 40 percent of its taxable income or 1.05 million dollars. Things quickly become too complex for a video if we start dealing with any of the details. 
And speaking of details, at the time of this video, regulations had not been proposed. So there are a lot of unanswered questions, some of which I've mentioned. An inherent aspect of computing the deduction by reference to return on assets is to allow lower deductions for manufacturers than for resellers. Manufacturing tends to be much more tangible asset intensive than resale. To sum up, Section 250 provides domestic corporations with what is in effect two deductions which together are limited to taxable income. First is a deduction for one half of the net Section 951 Cap A inclusion. Second is 37.5% of the portion of net income from sale, lease, or license of property to foreign persons for foreign use and services performed outside the USA. The portion is net taxable income with exclusions representing return on tangible depreciable assets in excess of 10% times the ratio of qualifying foreign income to total qualifying income, with some exclusions. I encourage you to read Section 250 and suffer through its cutesy jargon before attempting any calculations. I hope you found this useful. I'm Steve Fox, CPA. Thanks for learning with me.